Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we explore the far reaches of the globe in search of unique characters and stories to share. Reach beyond your front door and let's chat about art, architecture, history, real estate, and more. Let's jump in. Haruki Murakami, a contemporary Japanese author, once said, Death is not the opposite of life, but a part of it. Death, dying, and the rituals that surround them vary widely around the world, reflecting the cultural beliefs held by the people left behind. How do we grieve? How do we manage the anguish that accompanies the finality of the death of someone we love? We are grateful for the opportunity to speak with Jill Bodak, author of Loved Into Being, Reflections on Stroke and Being Indestructible, a memoir of sudden tragedy, caregiving, and the journey to the end. So join us as we muse on our mortality and explore the depths of death and dying. In North America, death is the great unknown and is regarded often with fear and apprehension. Those who are left behind experience what seems like insurmountable grief. We mourn their absence, the lost opportunities to make new memories, and perhaps a chance to say things to them that were left unsaid. Mm -hmm. No matter if a loved one passes suddenly or after a long illness, we often feel as if there just wasn't enough time to process their leaving and to say goodbye. Yeah, experiencing death oneself or the death of a loved one is deeply personal and can be both heartbreaking and even sometimes liberating. Yeah, you're right about that. The heartbreak comes from the permanence, I think, and the finality of it. We perceive death as an end, and it's more than just the ending of their life. It's an end of our relationship with them, an end to being physically close to them, an end to being able to hear their voice, share your thoughts with them. It's an end to so, so much. Yeah, it is so hard. Grief can be debilitating and complex for everyone. Everyone moves through it also at their own pace, aren't they? Yeah, they do. Many people do also seek out grief counselors who provide support and guidance through the grieving process. It's really such important work. It really is. It can be very helpful to have someone to talk to, particularly as the world keeps turning and people return to their lives. You're still there, mired in your own grief. Support groups with people who have had similar losses can be really helpful too. We all experience our grief differently, and the circumstances of our losses are different, but it can be comforting to be around others who are going through a similar life event. I know someone who actually remarried someone in his bereavement group after losing his own wife. Oh, how lovely. Mm -hmm. Um, Speaking of grieving publicly, this reminds me of a recent CBC Instagram post I saw about the Cause No Denwa or wind phone, which was set up by John Riley along the Van Tassel Lake Trail in Digby, Nova Scotia. This phone is disconnected, but it offers people the opportunity to speak to someone that they've lost and in the process express their grief in a public space. The idea is said to have originated in northeastern Japan. In 2011, after the earthquake and tsunami, people were calling loved ones using disconnected phones. Wind phones can be found now in five provinces, and there's a website actually that tracks the number of phones in Canada. Wow, that is really a lovely mm-hmm. story. I think I saw that post too. Grieving is such a hard thing to experience. Did you know that the grieving process can often occur before someone has died? This is common in circumstances when a loved one has been given a terminal prognosis. Katrina Tae, an end-of-life doula and author, refers to this as anticipatory grief. I experienced this myself with my grandmother who had dementia. I grieved her loss long before she died when she was no longer really a semblance of herself. Right. In the instance of prolonged illness, counseling of the caregiver is often recommended. It's an exhausting and relentless responsibility, and it's incredibly difficult to shoulder the care, the grief, and often their everyday lives, including jobs and responsibilities, Mm -hmm. not to mention the stress of having to make life-changing medical decisions on behalf of their loved one. It's so hard. It is so hard. Scientists have actually studied what happens to our brains when we grieve. Scans of the regions in the brain that process grief and levels of the stress hormone cortisol have led some neuroscientists to regard grieving as a form of brain injury. 
Lisa Schulman, a neurologist at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and the author of the book Before and After Loss, A Neurologist's Perspective on Loss, Grief, and Our Brain, states that the emotional trauma of loss results in serious changes in brain function that endure over time. Oh, I don't find that surprising at all. No, neither do I. But you might be surprised to learn that we actually learn through love, loss, and our grieving. Clinical psychologist and associate professor of psychology at the University of Arizona, Mary Frances O'Connor, wrote an article entitled The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. She says that people who are grieving are already running thoughts about creating new habits in the background. Life is now fundamentally changed for these people, and we have to learn how to adapt. Though I think it might be easier to grieve in some cultures rather than others. So why do you say that, Harris? Well, John Frederick Wilson, Honorary Research Fellow, Director of Bereavement Services Counseling and Mental Health Clinic at York St. John University, presented a concise article on global traditions associated with dying in the article, Death and Dying, How Different Cultures Deal with Grief and Mourning. In his article, he points out In the West, grieving is very personal and individual, as opposed to Tibetan, Indian, Chinese, and Native American cultures where collective grieving is more common. Oh, I'd love to hear an example of collective grieving. Oh, well, I'll give you one, Walker. Excellent. When (laughs) someone in the Lakota tribe dies, the grief is felt and shared by all in the community. The elders remind the tribe of Mitakuye Oyasin, which means we are all related, and that the grief is shouldered by everyone. I like that. I do as well. What a comfort to share the burden of such sorrow, to know that you are not alone. This article also notes and compares the length of the grieving process from culture to culture. Now, I'm sure it varies widely. People in the West are always commenting on how long it takes someone to get through their grief. There seems to be a lot of judgment too about it. Yeah, there really does. People can be quite critical, in fact. It's either too long and someone needs to move past their loss, or they are too quick to bounce back and get on with their lives. Yeah, it's always easy to judge from the outside, isn't it? True. I'm not sure what North Americans would think of the Balinese. Their mourning period is actually quite short. John Frederick Wilson states that if family members do cry, tears must not fall on the body as this is thought to give the person a bad place in heaven. And to cry for too long is thought to invoke malevolent spirits and encumber the dead person's soul with unhappiness. So it's quite short. On the other hand, in Egyptian culture, a mourning period of seven years is not considered unusual. Wow, that is very different. Mm -hmm. A lot of our mourning and death rituals are managed in pretty short order here in the West. Funerals, cremations, and burials all usually happen within a week or so of the person's death. Did you know that funeral homes are designed and managed with the smallest details relating to easing the grief or comforting individuals? Actually, I did. People think funeral homes are dark and depressing, but many funeral homes spend a great deal of thought into designing their space to create an atmosphere that is calm, tranquil, and comforting. Hmm. Thought is given to the color of the paint, the lighting, the music, the furniture, and even the flow of the space within a funeral home. Soft natural lighting is often employed and light and airy drapery is preferred to thick velvet curtains of the past. Mm. Natural elements such as water features and plants are common as well these days. Some homes offer soft background music, aromatherapy, and even soft, comfortable furnishings. Well, that sounds lovely. Thank goodness the funeral homes have evolved like this. I think it would be much less jarring if you can come together to honor your loved one in a calm, contemplative place. Yes, it makes me think of our local cemetery. It is so lovely, full of mature trees and wildlife. It's so calm, and it's actually a place where much of the community enjoys their leisure time with a quiet stroll, a jog on a beautiful sunny day. Mm -hmm. I'm in that cemetery almost every day, usually walking the dogs or having a run with the girls. I find the tombstones historically fascinating, and the trees are just glorious, particularly in the springtime. Yes, the grave markers are really interesting, aren't they? There is such a variety of size, stone, and extravagance. Some are very modest, while others are the complete opposite, very grandiose. Mm -hmm. I love those big mausoleums. They're gorgeous, and they're a true testament to the wealth and social standing of the family that lies within. They really are amazing. I love the sentiments engraved on the markers as well. Now, did you know that there's a lot of importance placed in the iconography presented on the tombstone? I'm not surprised about that. Yeah, apparently Dr. 
Dr. Elisa Serena offers courses which explore funerary monuments, their appearance, and significance. Now, wouldn't that be an interesting course to take? It would be. Shall <laughs> we take it, Walker? Up. Yeah, I'm going to sign us up. It's a four-part course available on Atlas Obscura. Dr. Serena teaches the history of burying grounds, cemeteries, and gravestones in the United States. She explores Puritan and colonial practices in addition to African-American burying grounds and the practice of cremation, as well as common gravestone motifs and stone cutting techniques. If you want to learn more about this course, the cost and availability, you can go to Atlas Obscura online. Wow, maybe courses like this might actually help open up the conversation about death. So many people avoid discussing the subject. Mm. Even my own husband wouldn't discuss purchasing a plot years ago. He was too uncomfortable with the idea of death to even pursue it. Who knows where we're going to be buried now, Walker? It'll probably be in the backyard. I think some people are superstitious too, perhaps thinking they can keep death at bay if they don't acknowledge it. I know people who won't sign their organ donation cards because somehow maybe that makes death more of a reality for them, and maybe they think it might hasten it. It truly is inevitable, though, isn't it, Harris? Yeah, no one escapes it, Walker. There are so many interesting differences between cultures and their approach to death, dying, and grieving, many of which are owing to differences in religious beliefs and traditions— We might be most familiar with wakes, observing Shiva, and visitations. These are all fairly common practices in Western culture, which precede a funeral or a celebration of life. There are a lot of options these days for interment too. Traditionally, interment of a body in a casket or cremation were the most popular forms of burial. According to the Cremation Association of North America, cremation is the new tradition with greater than 55% of all Americans and 73% of Canadians choosing it in 2019. Cremation tends to be the preferred option still in areas where space is a premium. Wow, I can't believe 73% of Canadians. I know, I was surprised as well. The percentage was just under 50% in 2000, and this percentage has been increasing every year. Hmm. Cremation, for those of you who don't know, is defined as the process whereby human remains are reduced through mechanical, thermal, or other means of dissolution. Today, the term cremation also includes aquamation, also known as biocremation or resomiation, which uses a natural process referred to as alkaline hydrolysis, which is a water-based dissolution process for reducing human remains with a heating solution of 95% water and 5% potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. The water from the process goes to a wastewater treatment facility after the process is complete. The bones are then crushed into ash. It's said to be a very eco-friendly option, but because it is relatively new, it is less readily available. It was first in use in Canada and Saskatchewan in 2012, then in 2014 in Ontario, a year later in Quebec, and in 2021 in Newfoundland. Hmm, I've never even heard of aquamation. I know, right? Yeah. Caitlin stahl Paquette of the CBC wrote a very thorough article on aquamation just back in September. She notes that the process has been around since the late 1800s for disposing of livestock and actually helped safely dispose of livestock affected by mad cow disease in the 1990s. Hmm. Apparently, more recently, Desmond Tutu chose aquamation. Wow. Mm-hmm. I wonder how aquamation is more environmentally friendly than cremation, Walker. Well, according to Canadian Funerals Funeral Guide and Directory of Providers, it certainly is more environmentally friendly. Cremating a single corpse typically takes up to three hours of burning and releases almost 600 pounds of carbon dioxide, which not all the human remains can be contained within the filtration system used in the process. Mm. I read it was the equivalent of a 500-mile car journey. Wow. Yeah, I know. The process of aquamation takes longer, but the Canadian Funerals Funeral Guide states aquamation uses just 10% of the energy used during a fire cremation process, and there are no air emissions. That sounds pretty good. Yeah, it costs more than flame cremations, but less than a traditional casket burial and is more environmentally friendly with the carbon footprint being almost seven times lower than traditional cremation, and artificial joints and fillings, etc. are not burnt. If you go to the online Canadian Funerals website previously mentioned, they provide a tremendous amount of information and an informative video which explains the benefits of aquamation. Yeah, I think today more people are looking for eco-friendly options of burials, such as biodegradable caskets or bio-urns. 
In fact, my aunt had a green burial in the Shropshire Hills in England, and it gave me hope for something similar for myself one day. Most green burials prohibit embalming or any toxic or foreign substances that might be damaging to the natural environment, which I think is a lovely idea. She was laid to rest in a beautifully woven, locally made pine wicker casket, and it was draped in roses. We were in this tiny little chapel in candlelight. It was just beautiful. And her daughter later planted a cherry tree at her resting place. There is a strong movement now, I think, for green burial worldwide, and I really hope it catches on here in Canada. Oh, I do as well. Dr. Caitlin Hawk, author of The Environmental Impact and Potential Human Health Effects of Cremation, suggests that if you already have cremated remains in your possession but would like to dispose of them in an environmentally conscious manner, some conservation areas will allow you to bury or scatter cremation ashes. She points out that if you do wish to bury the ashes, biodegradable urns made of sustainable materials will help reduce any carbon footprint. Now, did you know that cremated remains cannot decompose without enzyme reduction? No. There are urn options available that will allow for mixing organic matter with the remains. Wow, that's really interesting. Here's another option, too, that you might not have heard of, Walker. Apparently, cremated remains can be added to specialty concrete and cast into reef bases, contributing to the artificial development and restoration of coral reefs. Now, that would be a totally lovely legacy, wouldn't it? Perfect for the ocean lover or scuba diver. You might want to be mindful, though, if you want to scatter your loved one's ashes. If you do so and are permitted to by the cemetery, that land is protected from reuse for other purposes. But if you decide to scatter or bury remains elsewhere, it might be public or privately owned land. So it might be best to think these things through. All of that is clearly most relevant for North Americans, but I find it fascinating how all cultures have their very own distinct approach to death and funerary rites. For instance, in Japan, death is accepted as a very real part of the process of living and is anything but a taboo topic to discuss at any age. That's the way it should be, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't disagree. Cremation is common, though, there. Apparently, the body is cremated at a low temperature in order to ensure bone preservation. The bones are then interned in a grave that was purchased at birth by their parents. Family members visit the grave daily for a minimum of 15 days and then every year on the anniversary of the deceased passing. Mm, That sounds like a lovely tradition. It gives people some time and space for grieving. It does. Though many funeral traditions tend to be solemn, in Latin America, end-of-life rituals tend to be more colorful and more uplifting. Take, for example, El Dia de los Muertos, or the Day of the Dead celebrations. People honor the loved ones who have passed with decorative altars, beautiful and colorful flowers, and delicious food. Now, in respect to funerals themselves, have you heard of sky burials? No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. These are practiced in Tibet by Buddhists. Sky burials involve leaving the deceased body outside for birds and animals to eat, thus creating sustenance for the living while helping the soul transition to heaven. Wow, a green burial in its own way. Absolutely. Other elements, such as water, play an important role in some funerary practices, such as those in Nordic countries. Coffins bearing their loved ones are placed on a cliff facing towards the water. Sometimes the casket is sent out into the ocean on death ships. In this way, their loved one is being returned to the gods. Yeah, I've read about that tradition. And in fact, it has been illustrated in that popular show, Vikings. Have you seen it, Walker? Oh, it's good. It's Mm. a good one. Now, how we say goodbye to our loved ones is often steeped in centuries of tradition. In India, for example, the preparation of the body of the deceased occurs within 24 hours as the body is not embalmed. Right. The preparation is most often done by immediate family. The body is washed and sprinkled with holy water, wrapped in white cloth, and sometimes covered in brightly colored fabrics, flowers, or jewels before being paraded through the streets before cremation. It is at cremation that is believed that the spirit is released to be reincarnated once again. Yeah, that sounds gorgeous. And it it reminds me of a Tamil funeral that I attended. It was very extensive and it was very much defined by rite and ritual. Even though I didn't understand what was actually being said during the service, the experience was very colorful and very much full of love. I remember you speaking of it, Harris. One African funerary practice that I love involves the construction of elaborate coffins personalized with images that represent the interests of the deceased while in life. Yeah, I've seen a documentary on this. It's very cool. 
Coffin artists, as they're known, create custom caskets in Ghana that are in the shape of something near and dear to the deceased. These can be in the shape of absolutely anything. A fish, a Coca-Cola bottle, a car. They're truly works of art. I think these rituals and practices are all exercised in an effort to bring us closer to our loved ones who have died. For example, in Peru, some graveside guests will chew coca leaves as they believe it might be a way to connect more closely with the deceased. Well, if you really want to get connected, there is the turning of the bones practice by the Malagasy people in Madagascar. Every few years, the tombs are opened and the family will freshly rewrap the body. Music and dancing normally accompany, making it the true celebration. Yeah, and I think it needs to be a celebration of the life lived. But holding on to a part of our loved ones, I think, is very, very common. Many people will keep some or all of their loved ones' ashes in an urn, like we've discussed, or in a small vial in the form of a pendant worn on a chain as a way of keeping a loved one close to your heart. This is similar to the way the Victorians wore brooches containing the hair of their deceased loved ones. You can even turn cremated remains into a diamond. Are you kidding me, Walker? I'm serious. You can turn your loved one into a diamond to be set in a ring. Wow. I guess I shouldn't be so surprised, though. In South Korea, the ashes of a deceased loved one can be turned into shiny beads, which are displayed in vases. So ingenious. I'm sure we are just scratching the surface of a multitude of ways people have tried to keep their loved ones close to them. Yeah, I think so. I think these traditions and rituals try to make sense of death and dying. Though it is inevitable for all of us, death, dying, and the grief of those left behind is complex, heart-wrenching, and so very difficult to navigate. We are honored to talk today to Jill Bodak, a manual osteopath, writer, speaker, and anatomy educator in Toronto, Ontario. She has just released her debut memoir, Loved Into Being, Reflections on Stroke and Being Indestructible. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. So I just finished your beautiful book, Loved Into Being. It is steeped in love. It's a tribute to your family's shared experience after your father's stroke. And one of my favorite lines is, we did not plan for it, but our family had ruptured and love is what poured out, which I just think is one of the most exceptionally beautiful lines I've ever read, frankly. Will you share what impact this experience has had? I know this is a big question and perhaps what the experience of writing this book has had on you and your family. I can try. I, I think that that's sort of a two part answer. The, the impact of the experience of my dad's stroke. And for those who haven't read the book, it's a story about a 60 year old man on a ski trip who's halfway down a run in Kelowna, BC, and then he just falls over. And as though the the world and our lives can just stop in an instant in that way. So he had a stroke on a ski hill. He has three children. I'm the eldest. And, you know, we're all in our late 20s, early 30s. And the story is about what happens when you're sort of semi-adulting uh, in Toronto, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you're in this this acute health crisis. You're flying across the country, and and that rupture it pushed the limits of my family unit to to the point where it really did feel like we were tearing. Like we just weren't prepared for that much pressure that fast. Mm-hmm. And in the tear, the way I write about it is is kind of along the theme of imagination versus reality. Like if you were to tell me that would happen, I would think, oh, it'll be a total disaster. But actually the lived experience of it had so much beauty. And so when I say, you know, our family ruptured and love is what poured out, it really felt that way. That's the impact of actually the whole experience now. So it's three years after his stroke, my dad died, um, on December 6th, 2022, about two months ago. And, and that, that theme, the rupture and the love pouring out, it actually just continued it, it, uh, his recovery and his decline and his death were continuous ruptures. And actually what kept coming out was this kind of togetherness that my family 
seems filled with. Like we really came together and experienced something in a way where being being in it together felt better than than fraying apart. Mm -hmm. Which can be a common experience when you are going through something so traumatic. People tend to either fray and break apart or or really bring themselves together as your family did. And that beauty that you describe that was a part of the experience, as difficult as it was, is very, very evident in your book. And so I'm grateful that you shared it. So you mentioned your dad had this this long journey. So it started with the event on the ski hill, which he, I think, himself called the ski disaster. That's right. <laughs> right? Which is very appropriate. And then he began this really long, non-linear journey with all of you in support and by his side. And he, he fought mm -hmm. for recovery in all of that time. But then it became apparent that this was a fight he didn't want to take on any longer. So how did your father's decision to end his life on his own terms come about? Well, it wasn't fast, that's for sure. And looking back on it now, I think he was probably thinking or feeling that way for a long time before we figured out that's what he was thinking and feeling. He didn't have a lot of word choice in his repertoire. So his stroke had left him, he was called nonverbal, but we could talk to him. He could talk to us. It just, it was different. And so you know, it took time from last spring of 2022 through to the summer. I think he was trending that way. And it wasn't until August, late July, early August of 2022, that we really started to hear what he was trying to say. He had done stroke recovery so brilliantly, so fearlessly and with such incredible commitment he was so unbelievably strong. That's why I use the word indestructible. And often in his recovery, I would have to remind him that we didn't try to keep him alive. He just didn't die. And that was really helpful reminder for him sometimes when he was really suffering. Mm -hmm. We weren't pumping him full of things that were keeping him alive. We mm -hmm. were just like, you're just not dying. So we better keep living because you're here. And, and through the stroke recovery part of the book and the front half, we were trending upwards and we were doing the raw, raw, we'll recover. And then post-stroke seizures are a thing that happened to some people. And my dad started over a year after his stroke, which is kind of rare. He kind of kept it together um, inside his own brain for quite a while. And then it was the seizures really that, it was not the stroke, it was the seizures that came after that really kept just knocking him down again and again in a way where he couldn't do the recovery that he was willing to do. He couldn't mm -hmm. keep pushing himself the way that he always pushed himself because the seizures just took him out at the knees every time. And, and we lost so much every time that he seized. And it was kind of like Groundhog Day for him. It's like, wake up and start over, wake up and start over. And I think that's the one that sort of tipped the scales in the favor of him not wanting to be around for that kind of life. It was a lot of pain and he was extraordinarily strong, but it was so much suffering. And so through that summer, as he figured out how to let me and my family know that he didn't want to be alive anymore. That's when we started to say, if you really, really mean that, we can help you. Mostly so he wouldn't have to help himself solve that problem. And that's a, a gift of love as well. But how did you come to terms yourself within yourself with that decision, Jill? It was hard. It was maybe the hardest. I know that's sort of a difficult thing to quantify, but I do think that is one of the hardest things internally I've ever had to come to terms with. And I remember saying to a friend, it's the first time I've, I've felt in my life 
an understanding of what it's like to accept something intolerable. Yeah. And that's what it was for me, learning to accept something totally intolerable and continue to engage with it. Mm -hmm. And I will say that it's a blessing, the medically assisted death for people who qualify in what's called track two, meaning that they're not going to die imminently from their disease. Track two made means that you have a 90 day wait period from the time that you're assessed and approved to the time that you're allowed to die. So it's at least 90 days. And that was a blessing for me. It was not a blessing for my dad. It couldn't come fast enough for him. But for my family, those 90 days really gave us the opportunity to accept something intolerable, to uh, resource myself in the ways that I felt like I needed. For me, that looked like a really good therapist that I'd been in relationship with for a long time. Uh, I have a, a voice teacher, so I actually did a lot of singing before he died. Oh, good. And it helped so much. Yeah, uh, healing. I, Music is yeah. so healing. Yeah. I was singing Bridge Over Troubled Water. So if you want a good way to cry. <laughs> or I could like right a, now just think. Uh, yeah, yeah a, a theme beautiful. song, a theme song for what it felt like I was trying to do with him. Mm -hmm. uh, that musicality and, and the way that I could make noise with my sadness really helped. Mm -hmm. And then I was, I was writing and I really was getting ready. I was getting ready to do that with him too. We both had 90 days to get ready for whatever that looked like. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, um, it's a process. And in some ways, even speaking from my own personal experience, it, it's a little bit of a gift to have that time to do the things you need to do in terms of your own self-care and also any, you know, little extras you might want to address with your, with your loved one. Had you ever known anybody who had gone through the maid experience before, or was this something brand new to you and your family? I had never had anyone in my family go through that before, but I run a clinical practice here in the West End of Toronto, and I have seen more than one patient through that process. Okay. And so I was familiar with it from that vantage point, from a uh, very familiar with the support role, but not so familiar with the emotional element or the personal element of it. Mm -hmm. Did it help that you had had some kind of understanding of the process prior? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it must have. And I also think it would have been so different if I had never even heard about made as an option or if it was coming to me as sort of uh, an out of the blue suggestion. And it was not that I was a little more grounded in the process. And I understood what it might look like for us, my family and for my dad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you were a great resource for your siblings and, uh, and the rest of your family through that experience. Yeah. Um, Jill, I have to say, Personally, having witnessed my own father die of cancer, I was really struck by how accurately you described the utter exhaustion that experienced by caregivers. Honestly, when I read your book, I felt like I was reliving that time leading up in 1999 in my dad's last few weeks. Was sharing the caregiver experience something you set out to do when you first made the decision to write the book? Or did you discover during the writing process that, that you couldn't separate the two? Thank you for asking that because, number one, you're not the first person to tell me that they feel really mirrored in the caregiving because I think the experience is so universal and it's not often shared in that full frontal way that's like, it's like this, guys. And I'm not the only one going through it. There are so many families across our country caregiving in the absolute full frontal realness of that right this minute. And so I didn't mean to write about it to be gory or graphic or emotionally extreme. It's actually really just like that. It's so tiring and it's lonely. And when I finished the book before my son was born in 
in April of 2022, I kind of put a period on the end of the book and it was a tribute to caregivers. Mm. And that's what I initially thought it would be. It wasn't until that summer happened and nothing was going on with the book that my dad was shifting gears towards me that I was like, okay, I see. It's also a book about about end of life care. But in the beginning, it was a tribute to caregivers, kind of from my very jarring lived experience of like, holy crap, this is what people go through. All of my friends that have lost parents, all of the people that I know who have been in that role, I think it was like this for all of them. And so I wrote what it was like for me and it is really healing for me to have that reflected back by people that have been walking alongside someone who is ill to say it was like that for them too. And another thing, if you don't mind me adding here, is that the moments in the book, you know, the woman laying on the gurney by herself and other patients in the hospital when you were caring for your dad and they didn't have caregivers. I can remember thinking, oh my gosh, there are people here that that desperately need that support. And I can remember feeling guilt that I couldn't get around to them and that they had nobody with them. It, it just reinforced in my mind and my body how much was involved as a caregiver. You know, I thought that was very insightful that you pointed that out in the book as well. Absolutely. And the caregiving role is so selfless and it's so heroic. And for the people that don't have those heroes in their lives, I do think lives end sooner and sadder and in ways that maybe we can't even write about. It's actually too painful to think mm -hmm. about, about not having the caregiver. You know, it's hard to read about the caregiving, like, wow, that's so hard. But it's way worse to think about not having that. Absolutely. Now, you had mentioned at the beginning of the book that you'd been plagued with this, this fear of death for a good part of your life prior to taking your anatomy class that led you to Carl. Mm -hmm. Now, can you explain for our listeners how Carl the cadaver, to whom you were grateful for the hands-on learning of anatomy, had an impact on this fear and how your time spent with Carl may have influenced you? Because I found this a really interesting and and very just such a respectful and beautiful part of the book as well. Sure. So in the book, I, I do go back and forth between past and present to try to tell the reader a little bit about myself so they can kind of understand how we got here. Like how did my relationship with my dad kind of get to this position and, and my relationship with my siblings? And one of the things that I really try to flesh out is my relationship with death. And, and I'm very honest that it was something that terrified me as a kid. And then that I was running from in my teenage years, it was like a source of anxiety. And then as I got into my 20s and into my post-secondary education life, it was kind of a fascination where it was like, oh, these bodies, they're so fragile. They're so fleeting. They're so amazing. They're so mortal. And I went to a cadaver lab as an osteopath. So I was already working in the public when I went there, treating bodies every day and wanting to know more about them. So I write about this cadaver lab where um, for a week with two of my dearest friends, we dissected this man in his 70s that we named Carl. It was not his real name. And the impact of that experience on me was so important to share because it was like the pinnacle of death terror. It was like, well, let's go right in there, not even not even face to face, but like beyond the face, like inside of dying. And so I do describe it pretty vividly in the book because it was so vivid for me. And, and I share it because it was like that imagination versus reality thing, where for my whole life, I had been like, death, 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 oh, no. And then I met Carl. And I was like, how beautiful, how 
totally okay is this? How completely natural and sacred and intimate is it to be this close to a life that has ended and a body that's turning into something else? When you were describing it, it again, it was like I was there. It was so vivid and so respectful. And I mean, if we're if we're going to use a metaphor here, you literally were peeling back your your fears when you were there with Carl. Jill, I want to thank you. Your memoir is an emotional and authentic journey, and we are so grateful that you've shared it with us today. For our listeners, Jill's debut nonfiction work, Loved Into Being, can be found to purchase on Amazon, and you can also find Jill herself at www.jillbodak.com, and that's B-O-D-A-K. Proceeds from her book will be donated to Dying with Dignity, Dying with Dignity Canada, DWDC is a national human rights charity committed to improving quality of dying, protecting end-of-life rights, and helping people across Canada avoid unwanted suffering. Thank you, Jill. Thank you so much, Jill. Yeah, thank you, both of you. What a powerful book. It really is a touchstone for the caregiver, for all those who have lost someone, and particularly those who are contemplating medically-assisted dying or have a loved one who may have chosen this step. Now, I haven't had any experience with medically assisted dying. My loved ones passed away before such an option was available. Mm -hmm. When my father was battling cancer, I could imagine, though, how assisted suicide would be a very desirable and humane option for individuals who are terminally ill and suffering. Yeah, I am so grateful that MAID or medical assistance in dying is an option. It's been legal in Canada since 2016, but in other parts of the world much earlier. In the Netherlands since 2001, with self-administered made being legal in Switzerland since 1942. Can you believe it? 1942? So what is the process to apply for made? Yeah, that's a good question, Walker. I think there is quite a bit of misinformation floating around out there. It is a very rigorous process to follow. An individual has to be evaluated by two independent healthcare professionals to determine if they qualify You have to be 18 years of age or older and be making this request voluntarily without any external pressure. According to Dying with Dignity Canada, you have to have a serious illness, disease or disability, or be in an advanced state of decline that can't be reversed and must be experiencing unbearable physical or mental suffering from an illness, disease or disability. You must also be eligible for government-funded health insurance in Canada. There are extensive procedural safeguards too. Of course, the request can be withdrawn at any time for any reason. There's never an obligation to proceed with the process, even if approval has already been granted. And the individual may withdraw the request right up to the moment of the procedure. In fact, you must confirm that you consent to receive medical assistance in dying immediately before the injection is delivered, unless you have signed a waiver of final consent. Details regarding this process and aspects such as final consent and advanced consent can all be found on the Dying with Dignity Canada website. So are people with dementia potential candidates for MAID? According to Dying with Dignity Canada, some people with dementia can access MAID if they satisfy the requirements stipulated by federal law. And what about patients suffering from mental health-related issues? I know in Belgium and the Netherlands, individuals suffering from chronic schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, severe eating disorders, autism, personality disorders, and even prolonged grief have been granted medical-assisted dying. I know it is still a controversial topic, though, even among mental health specialists. It definitely is. And for now in Canada, the short answer is no. People are not eligible at this time if their sole medical condition is mental illness. This was expected to change next month, but on February 2nd, the federal government delayed MAID for people whose sole medical condition is a mental illness until March 17th of 2024 in order to provide them with more time to gather more data and to create a plan for a standard of practice and training. Some people can be considered, though, if they also have a grievous and irremediable physical health condition. It is a complex issue with many moving parts. No wonder it is dominating the headlines and medical online publications these days. Yeah, absolutely. I actually have personal experience with MAID. One of my dear friends had been suffering from multiple congenital issues his whole life. He had tens upon tens of surgeries, including multiple heart surgeries. 
He was on the heaviest of pain meds, and his quality of life, to be frank, was terrible. The process took over a year in total, giving him and the people who loved him a lot of time to think it all through, mull it over, talk it out, and ask a million questions. When he died last year, it was in the company of friends and with peace and joy in his heart. The whole thing had a profound impact on my life, and it was being there with him that truly, I think, dissolved any remaining fear I had of death. It was quiet, it was peaceful, and it was just love. Well, that is so beautiful, Harris. Death and dying is difficult to navigate for those left behind. If you need more information or support, please seek a local resource near you. For a place to start, Mary Curie Online is a website that offers a wealth of information and support on all aspects of dying, death, and bereavement. We will include additional resources in our show notes as well. Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your hosts, Harrison Walker. Subscribe to follow us each week as we continue the conversation. And drop us a comment on Instagram at at Harrison Walker. We would love to hear from you.